the British people are about to have practiced upon them a trick even cruder and more shameless than that by which they were cheated out of their inheritance of parliamentary self-government in the first place when we acceded to the European Economic Community. However, since the trick is basically the same one over again. It is to be hoped that the people will not be taken in twice, but will listen to those who warned them correctly before. When the proposal that Britain should join the common market was put forward in 1971 and 72, and again, when at the referendum it was proposed that British membership should be confirmed, the public were told officially and solemnly by the political parties that the British Parliament would lose none of its effective power. British ministers, it was said, could always veto whatever appeared to them to be contrary to British national interests. They dare not agree to anything that Parliament disapproved. Those who warned that the first step was being taken towards the political unification of Western Europe and the degrading of the United Kingdom to the status of a European province were laughed to scorn. They were told that any such development, if it ever took place, would be many years, perhaps generations, in the future. Well, the referendum had not been over for six months before the government and the political parties were singing a different tune. The veto, it appeared, was more often a veto in reverse, a veto which others could use against what we wanted or proposed, but which we could not use to protect ourselves against what we did not want. A classic example is fishing, where unless the rules of a community are changed, the fleets of all the other members will be able to fish right up to our beaches. We cannot veto this because it's in the treaty which the Conservative government signed and the Labour government failed to renegotiate. It is the status quo. But any change in it that we want, such as an exclusive 50 mile zone for our fishermen, can be vetoed out of hand by any of the members, even by landlocked Luxembourg. Month after month, we have had ministers coming to the House of Commons and declaring themselves opposed to community policies. Why, they positively encourage the House of Commons to vote against those policies. Then they go off to Brussels. And presently, they come back, having agreed to those very policies, wringing their hands and saying, we don't like this any more than you do. But we had to accept it because it was part of a package. Now, of all silly sayings, one of the silliest is the saying, you can't put the clock back. Of course you can put the clock back, and you often do. If a clock is showing the wrong time, you put it back or forward, whichever is necessary, without the slightest hesitation. So in human life, and in a nation's life, if a mistake has been made, we ought to put it right, if we can. Some mistakes, especially in an individual's life, are irreversible. And there may, though more rarely, be such in the life of a nation. But we ought always to be on our guard against those who tell us so, who whisper in our ear, it's done now, and it can't be undone. For those are commonly the voices of cowardice or indolence. Yeah. And sometimes of downright evil intent. Certain of the mistake which Britain made in giving up her parliamentary self-government and national independence to become a part of the European Economic Community is not irreversible. One would suppose it was. And that is what you are intended to suppose. To listen to the chorus of politicians and newspaper editors who keep chanting like an incantation. You're in the market now. 
the referendum's over. You've got to live with it now and make the best of it, whether it was right or wrong, and whether you like it or not. Most of them must know, and all of them ought to know, that that is not true. Whenever it is repeated, it is the repetition of a falsehood, conscious or not. That can be proved, and conclusively and irrefutably proved in an instant. The government itself, when in 1975 it proposed to the electorate that they should answer yes at the referendum, stated clearly and without qualification in the official declaration that after the referendum, if a majority was for staying in, the continued membership of Britain would still depend on the continuing assent of Parliament. Our charter is enshrined in the very words of the government's own referendum statement. The British Parliament retains the final right to repeal the act which took us into the market. Thus, our continuing membership will depend on the continuing assent of Parliament. No room there for the suggestion that now the referendum's over, it's all settled. No. The government's solemn assurance is that the question is not settled and remains at all times open. Nor is there any room for arguing that we are bound, either morally or legally, to a decision once taken. If that were so, there could be no talk about the continuing assent of Parliament. Parliament would have to be told, you're bound now and cannot and must not break your word. Nothing of that. Parliament, which is to say the electorate who create parliaments, is as free at any moment to withdraw its assent, either to British membership as such, or to anything argued to be implicit in British membership, as it is to alter the standard rate of income tax, roll on the day, or to repeal the 50 mile an hour speed limit, and roll on that day too. <laughs> I have quoted the law to you. The formal legal position, as the government have officially affirmed it. But it would be disingenuous to pretend that there is not a higher law according to which no nation can be bound against its will to the surrender and renunciation of its freedom, independence and sovereign identity. The right to nationhood is one of those rights of which it may be said that time does not run against it. It is not yet known whether the Scottish nation will decide by a majority to resume the status which they relinquished in 1707. But if they do, I would like to hear their reply to those who would tell them that they could not do it because of the Treaty of Union. History is littered, and some of its most glorious pages are adorned with the instances of nations which reasserted and reclaimed their rights to govern themselves and live under their own laws and policies, not after five or ten years of eclipse, but after centuries. It is bitterly ironical that an Englishman of all people should need to argue the point at all to his countrymen. Seeing that, historically, we have made the cause of nations rightly struggling to be free our own cause. In doing so, in doing so, we have been deterred by no superstitious awe before the title deeds of tyrannies or empires. There is no superior jurisprudence which can ever say to a nation, you shall not or you shall no longer be the masters of your own fate. I doubt indeed whether any nation can ever be brought to renounce its own self-mastery except it was deceived, except by means of trickery and cheating. Certainly it was by deception that Britain was hijacked into the European community in 1972. 